Good morning, Flutus. This video is about the topic of being sick, getting sick, and having to play gigs as a freelancer, and um, or not being able to play gigs because you're sick, and the financial consequences of that, or just the general financial consequences of being a freelancer. This is a topic it seems no one talks about. So I came across a post on, Inst on Facebook from a fellow longtime freelancer like myself, who I know. I read her post and she apparently got COVID recently and then just sort of wrote this, an open letter to herself. And it's, <laughs> I related to this so hard. This is, and almost any freelancer who's been freelancing for 20 plus years could relate to this. So first of all, here is this post she wrote, an open letter to 30 years ago me. Dear me, I know you are determined, scrappy, and tenacious, but for God's sakes, find a way to fund your career. It's really adorable that you've thrown all reason aside to make it work, but eventually you'll see that many of those who influenced you either already had high level gigs or someone funding them. No, of course they aren't telling, going to tell you that part. And guess what? Everyone who hires you is going to make sure you give their gig 1000% and pay you like five cents for it. By the way, every concert you are prepping for will probably all be around the same time. So have fun trying to prioritize your practicing. So go ahead, me, follow that passion. Yahoo! But please don't try to start a family or have medical coverage. If you do get a side hustle so that you can at least try to dig out of the debt you accrued to pay for your cello, your lessons, your rent, your food, and your health care, just don't tell your colleagues because your old school teachers helped instill a lovely inner fear of being considered a fraud if you do anything outside of the music industry, even though no one really gives a crap what you do. It's just for fun for anxiety to have that chokehold. Not that you will actually have the time for a side hustle. What with the thousand gigs you need to prep for all the same time, all at the same time. Oh, one last note, pardon the pun. If you keep going with your adorable passion, determination, never, ever, ever get sick. Bet you thought I'd say give up <laughs> because then you don't get paid. So <laughs> I, along with lots of my freelancer colleagues responded like, yep that sounds right or i don't know whether to laugh or cry this is all accurate or you know tons of comments just being able to relate to this sentiment of being an older freelancer and reflecting back with everything that she said in here it's just like a funny vent because she got covid apparently and then had to probably cancel a bunch of gigs and then does not earn income and etc etc so in a few of the comments she had to write of course to defend herself, you know, people would say, it's just so, you're just being negative. Of course, these people are young and um, are enjoying right now being an adjunct at three different colleges and in four different regional orchestras and teaching a studio of 30 kids and they think every, everything's positive. And that's awesome. I've done that. I've done that exact same thing I just described. And I also had to work at Starbucks. And it's great for a while, but it's unsustainable. And so this, cellist who wrote this post had to had to say in her defense which I think summarizes the whole point is that many musicians are not set up for the financial truth of being full-time freelancers I'm reading from her comment here if you if they don't get the big gig so a lot of people are spending all their time and money and effort auditioning for full-time orchestras or even regional orchestras and somehow flying all over the country or the world doing this so how they do that, I don't know. And it's unsustainable. Um, whereas, meaning that in the meantime, you're going to be freelancing, you know, playing pickup gigs, maybe a few regional orchestras, teaching adjunct, all this stuff. But it's unsustainable financially. And the very real issue of if and when, because it's a win, you get sick, you're just out all that. You're not protected in any way. So, and then I, I made a comment, could I read this post aloud on my YouTube channel, et cetera, you can see it there. And then she responded with, absolutely, I think it would be great for freelance musicians to get it through their heads that there needs to be income flowing from somewhere else in order to sustain a music career. It should be normalized to the point of being a required part of a music student's curriculum. That response is everything. Again, I just can't stress this enough. This post or this video I'm doing is not just about being a Debbie Downer here um, or just being negative. 
but trying to instill the very real big picture of what it means to be a career freelancer on your own without um, support from a spouse or family or whatever, just financially making it on your own. And what that really means, um, this should be brought up in college. So if you're gonna go out and be a musician, it's very, very likely, most likely that you're going to be freelancing. It's very, very unlikely that you're going to have a full-time orchestra job. You, if you do, and that's amazing, you are in the 1%. So going through, when I read through her original post here, and because I said I could relate, like for ex if I just give you some examples of, of how this affected me or my examples of what she's talking about, like at the, uh, towards the beginning, she, in that first part where she says, but eventually you'll see that many of those who influenced you either already had high level gigs or someone funding them. So again, just, just take note if the person is like, yeah, just spend all your time doing this thing, auditioning for full-time orchestras. You shouldn't, and discouraging you to get a, you know, quote unquote, real job, or making you feel like you're going off track if you do that. That person, if they're a full-time orchestra member, usually, not always, but usually those people go right from conservatory to full-time orchestra job. In other words, they have no idea what it's like to be a freelancer, what it means financially for you for the long run. A good example would be when, and I've joked about this with my other freelance colleagues, like when, whenever like your own kids, your children, or maybe one of your students um, shows interest in going into music as a, as a profession, like a performance degree, not education, but performance, all freelancers' reactions to that are, oh God, you know, it's like, it's, it's so tough, no health insurance, no, whatever. There's a list of, of cons. Um, but, if, <laughs> but if somebody, um, if you say, oh, my student or my child is interested in going into music performance and you say that to somebody who has a full-time orchestra job or has a prof is a professor at a college, um, they're like, ooh, that's wonderful. You know, they, their first reaction isn't like, oh God, you know, the hardships that are going to come for that person. So I'm not saying that to just try to be mean to people that are full-time orchestra people or whatever. I'm just trying to point out that people who actually live the life that are in the trenches have a re ha know the realities that it's a very, very difficult um, route. As she goes on in her post where she says, um, go ahead and follow that passion, etc." you know, being funny, but please don't try and start a family or have medical coverage. That's very real for myself. Um, I had a baby, you know, in the middle of my freelance career and I had no maternity leaves freelancer. I mean, I was a member of a few regional orchestras, but you don't have like maternity leave or even sick days or, or whatever. And I was adjunct and you know just did tons of freelancing so i had to play in an orchestra all the way up until the very very moment practically that i gave birth i uh played all the way up until i a few days before my due date and it was very uncomfortable and all that and then as soon as i gave birth i had i think it was on a Friday, on a Tuesday, I believe, I had to go back into college and to my community college and teach my class. I just, I had to, I had to do it. There was no option because an adjunct, you don't have any protections or at least not the one I was at. So, uh, and that was, and there's almost like this weird badge of honor for freelancers to, to say things like, yeah, I worked all the way up until the bitter end or the bitter beginning, <laughs> whatever, until you had to give birth. And then, yeah, I went right back 48 hours later and yeah, I'm so strong. And, but that it's, um, I think that's unfortunate that we cry, try to create this <laughs> totally crazy uh, stressful situation as, as a standard to attain to because that those were awful days um, for me trying to freelance and having a, a baby and infant and all the driving and uh, and everything the other thing with the health insurance yeah um, 
I just had like catastrophic insurance only, or I can't really remember, but no real health insurance. And then towards the end of her post, when she says, if you keep going with your adorable passion, never, ever, ever get sick. This is so true. It's a little different now. I mean, she had got COVID, she says later in the post. So that's why, you know, she's sick and she's out all this work. Um, so nowadays it's a little different with getting sick and being expected to play. So now if you are sick, um, it's not quite the same as what it used to be, but it'll eventually go back to this, which is if you are sick at all, you just have to still go. You still have to go teach your class. You still have to go t um, to your orchestra rehearsal or your orchestra concert. You can't get out because if you do, if you say you're sick um, and you're never gonna plan for being sick, so it's not like you can give any advance warning to the contractor or the personnel manager, um, you, it's just frowned upon to just call in or email in and say, I am legitimately sick. What will happen is that you risk never being called again. It's just the way it is. No one purposely gets mean and decides to just take you off the list because you got sick. It's just the sort of the way it goes. You're just sort of ingrained over time as a freelancer of taking everything, every job, and you cannot call in sick. You cannot turn down things. And, and you're so afraid of losing work or losing being on sub lists or losing out on being on a contractor's roster. Um, that's always at the forefront of your mind. I had over time gotten a double ear infection and then also both my eustachian tubes completely filled with fluids. I went to clinics or some doctors and with very minimal health insurance, they just say, well, it's allergies and send you on your way. So it was never treated correctly. And I'm talking for like 10 plus years. And there was a good five to seven years where I couldn't hear out of almost anything in both ears. And I just kept playing. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to not get called, you know, for a gig. This is, and it's crazy, but this, that's how it is. So I remember distinctly playing in at Milwaukee Symphony. I was playing maybe the third flute over. I remember being embedded in a line of flutes. So I'm held in Laban and it was Edo Duvart conducting and we were holding a chord at the end of a movement or maybe the end of the whole piece. I don't remember. I think it was the end of a movement, just holding a chord and I couldn't hear anything. You know, you can't hear. It's like playing with very thick earplugs in and I could just feel my note going from me. I'm like, oh crap, and it just it just went away and made a weird kind of sound on its way out. But I just held my flute up and I don't know that anyone knew it was me, but it, you know, it was just so awful and uncomfortable. And luckily I was able to stay on the sub list. I thought, well, that's it for me. You know, I can't, that, that was an awful thing um, in a concert. And, um, but I, I survived, but I never told anybody like, I actually can't hear anything. So um, if something happens, you know, that's why, um, because you just won't be called again. It's as simple as that. Oh, and one time um, I played again with Milwaukee Symphony, we were playing the Firebird Complete Ballet. And I had been in Hawaii right before the first rehearsal, um, playing with the Hawaii Symphony. And I came back and I got really sick and I had all these like, it seemed like bites on my back and I, th and I had been on the beach. And so I thought, oh, I have all these sand flea bites um, and it was really uncomfortable. And I just got myself to that first rehearsal and did it. And as the week went on, I was felt so awful. Turns out I had shingles and I didn't know until after the week was over, I finally went in to a doctor um, and they're like, oh my God, you have shingles, but it had already worked itself out. So it was past, it was past um, time for medication or anything. But I remember just sitting in my chair, being in total pain and being miserable and just playing, getting my, just getting my job done and leaving, showing up the next day. And I was living in Chicago at that time. So I was commuting um, two, three, four hours each way just to get there. You know, and that's, I didn't th think much of it. Like, this is awful, I'm quitting. I just, it's just so typical that I didn't even think about it until I reflect back and think, that was insane. I can't believe I did that. I could go on and on about the times I played when I was sick, as any freelancer could. But the last 
one really where I was due to play with Lyric, uh, Lyric Opera of Chicago, and I got a diagnosis of um, blood cancer and I had to go in immediately for chemo. And of course, I could not play. I couldn't just show up and play. That was impossible. Um, so I had to contact uh, the personnel manager and explain the situation. And they were very, you know, um, concerned about my health and, you know, very nice and just don't worry about it. We'll find somebody. It was a very last minute thing. They had to get somebody to replace me in like 48 hours or something. I don't remember. But <laughs> as I thought would happen, so I did my six months of chemo. My, my number one concern besides staying alive, my number two concern then would be losing freelance work. That was absolutely on my mind every second of the day because I had to turn, I had to get rid of all my work and I just thought, well, that's it. I'm gonna be replaced for everything. And I did, wasn't replaced for everything years later, but still like um, I never ever was called from Lyric again. And it wasn't, um, they didn't do that, I don't think, to be mean. You know, it's just once you're taken off for any reason of the roster, somebody else will just replace you. And if they do a good job, they stay on the roster as a sub. Um, so that went away, you know. And also in Milwaukee, I was living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at this time. I was towards the end of my chemo, I think um, like a month after my last one, and I was feeling better. And then I knew Milwaukee was doing deafness. So I thought, um, finally, I'll, you know, because there's a, they'll need a fourth flute player. I'll be called for that. And then I got a call from the principal flute, and I saw her name come up. I'm like, yes. And she, she just wanted to know if they could borrow my alto flute um, for the sub that they got that already has a full time job, full time orchestra job, which is another for a whole other video. So that was just like so deflating, but not surprising. I was just sort of over time I got back on their, you know, their sub list and everything. But that's that's the reality of how it's going to work out. You'll just be taken off sub lists and you may not get that work back. In summary, to reiterate what this cellist had said was that she hopes that this conversation of having to have income coming from somewhere else as a musician is essential and and maybe eventually you cannot rely on that maybe but you have to have that and that that concept needs to be normalized and talked about in college if you're a performance major um, it needs to be part of the music students curriculum and i think that's I agree 100%. So this should be, this should not be shocking when you get into your 40s and 50s. Cause when you're early, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you just kind of, I know for myself, you're just like, you're just so happy you're freelancing and you're just living in the now. I did cover some of this, these topics in a video, which I'll link in the um, description here, which is a video I did on the pros and cons of freelancing. So there are lots of pros to freelancing. I mean, I'm still a freelancer, but the cons are very real and just need to be talked about and considered. To have a listen and see what, ex you know, freelancers that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years have to say and to take it seriously. If you thought this video was helpful or uh, maybe interesting, just even of uh, the life of a freelancer, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, just everything. I'm doing lots of videos weekly about the realities of freelancing. So please hit subscribe and you'll be in the loop for future videos such as this. Thanks for watching.